Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party. Please be seated. As part of the upcoming commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, we are holding this special joint town hall titled Battlefield to Boardroom. Today's event is hosted by the Army G4 Lieutenant General Raymond V. Mason, and our special guest is Vietnam veteran and FedEx Chairman and CEO, Mr. Fred Smith. We will begin with the Vietnam Veteran Tribute by the 3rd U.S. Infantry, traditionally known as the Old Guard. It is the oldest active duty infantry unit in the Army, serving our nation since 1784. Today, Staff Sergeant Abraham Vargas, Sergeant Jordan Fulton, and Specialist Sean Hackshaw, all dressed in Vietnam era uniforms, will perform a salute to our Vietnam veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, a short vignette of Vietnam. Vietnam. When I got my draft notice, I thought I knew what to expect. Since my dad served in World War II and Korea, turns out I had no idea what I was getting into. I've grown to love being a soldier, though. It's given me confidence and a sense of duty and honor. I've learned about the strength that comes from knowing that my fellow soldiers always have my back. I'm a squad leader now and there's no other job I'd rather have. It's a tough fight here, but this is exactly what we trained for. If the mission was easy, they wouldn't ask us to do it. Show a brief video of 10 Vietnam veterans. They are amongst the hundreds of thousands who were inspired by their Vietnam experience to reach new heights after the war. Ladies and gentlemen, we present Battlefield to Beyond. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. We must recognize that ending the war is only the first step toward building the peace. This is the story of 10 Vietnam veterans, among hundreds of thousands who found success after the war. Battlefield to Beyond. Battlefield to New Horizons. This is the strength of our country. The fact that we can take in people from all over the world. We are a nation of nations. We touch every nation and every nation on earth touches us. We have great soldiers to go forward and fight for us. We have intelligence people. We have all kinds of strengths and assets. But the greatest strength we have, the greatest asset we have to deal with the problems of our world and the challenges that we face is the nature of our society, our openness 
this wonderful, diverse society that we have. I served in the Vietnam War. I have more good memories of the experience than bad ones, but I've never wanted to relive it. I learned from it just as the country learned from it. Our defense relationship has evolved to an extent that was simply unimaginable even a decade ago. Our militaries exercised together. Indeed, the USS John McCain, a Navy destroyer, named for my father and grandfather, recently made a port visit in Da Nang, which shows if you live long enough, anything is possible. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. 33 years ago, as a young man serving in the Medical Corps in Vietnam, I learned firsthand how tenuous our hold on life can be. That experience inspired my interest in learning how the trillions of cells in our bodies interact to create and sustain life. Battlefield to the Cabinet. The Vietnamese have learned from their own history that we all have no permanent enemies, only friends yet to be made. Today, when Americans hear the word Vietnam, they are able to think of a country, not a war. And that is our shared accomplishment. I've always believed that uh, America's role in the world uh, is one that, and we've had variations of this throughout history, uh, has been one that should engage uh, the world. Uh, we can't dictate to the world, but we must engage in the world. We must lead with our allies. Uh, allies are, as everyone in this room knows, particularly important. No nation, uh, as great as America is, can do any of this alone. Three million men and women in uniform returned from Vietnam, grateful to resume their lives again. We are, in some cases, just now beginning to care for them the way we should have decades ago. We pledge that this work will continue. In caring for them, we honor the 58,282 names who are memorialized here. Battlefield to the Gridiron. Yeah, I was fortunate. We, we really had a good football team at Navy in 1963. We were um, um, number two team in the country. We, we uh, lost on a Friday night to SMU down in Dallas, Texas, which still drives you. There's people, there's people there never forget it. So, And then we lost in the Cotton Bowl. So I, I didn't really like the Cotton Bowl, uh, but, I, but we, we had really a good season. And um, because of that uh, season and, you know, a, a great team, I, was, I did receive the Heisman Trophy, which uh, was a pretty neat deal. Because when I was in Vietnam, I actually, my, my job was that, with the Naval Sport Group was supporting the Marine Corps. Right. And, oh, my God, they're, they're fantastic. And my heroes really are, the, are, the, are uh, those that uh, have, have really made a career of uh, their, their military responsibilities. It was a Wednesday. I was in my locker, getting changed before we went to our first meeting, when all of a sudden one of my teammates hollered, Hey, Blyer, there's a piece of mail over here for you. And it was my draft notification. And within 48 hours, I was on my way to basic training, advanced infantry training. Flew home, said hi, goodbye, found myself in San Francisco, boarding a plane, flew over the Pacific, oh, and landed in South Vietnam.
And I built up a pretty good rapport with my physician. Um, but that burning desire, that question that we have of, you know, about the future, what do you think? What do you think? Doc, do you think I can come back and play? Now his response was something like this. <laughs> don't worry. He said, you're going to have a normal life. You're going to be able to do the things that normal people do. Just don't expect to get back in the gridiron. Battlefield to Hollywood. Nashville Blast, I saw the light, and that's going to do it for part number one of a Dawn Buzz. And this is Army Special this past say, Jack. Ten minutes of news and sports coming up. We'll see you at 710 with the second portion of this thing, okay? Well, I spent you know, I spent three years in the Army. That was my uh, that was my uh, contribution to the effort. That was about a long time ago. And I'm I'm proud of that service and proud that we can honor uh, Army families to this day. And we have them on the show all the time. Battlefield to the boardroom. I learned an awful lot in the Marine Corps, particularly about, I think, how to treat people, uh, lead people, um, which has played a big role in FedEx, a big part of the employee relations uh, systems and all that that we have at our company came from my experience in the, in the service. Our generations before you, you took off the uniform, but you never stopped serving. You became teachers, and police officers, and nurses, the folks we count on every single day. You became entrepreneurs, running companies and pioneering industries that changed the world. It is my honor to introduce to you the Army G4 and the Army lead for the Vietnam 50th commemoration, Lieutenant General Raymond Mason. Well, Only, uh, it's magnificent. What a, what a wonderful looking crowd, and uh, I'll have some remarks about that in a second here. But let me actually start off with recognizing and thanking Scott Fletcher who's our master of ceremonies um, and really the brainchild behind this, this event today, as well as an event we had a couple months back where we recognized our nine Vietnam veterans in the G4. And, and also uh, Ty Akawao, where are you, Ty? I think I just saw you. Ty's back there as well. And uh, Eileen Zelton, as well as Alan Wallace. So let me give them, have, have them give them a round of applause. Really well done. You know, you just give them some basic guidance, and this magnificent team we have in the military just makes it all happen. So I'm very blessed with a remarkable team of professionals. You know, the video you just saw, I mean, I think it has a number of messages in it. Here were 10 rather common men who performed with uncommon valor. And they went on in their lives to contribute incredible to our nation, uh, to the world, and, and certainly to their families and loved ones. And I think that's a message for this latest generation of uh, warrior patriots who have served really in our longest war, 12 years, just around the same time actually as the length of the Vietnam War. But I think it's encouraging to us and, and the generation that's serving currently that you can take a difficult thing in your life and turn it into a magnificent success. And so I think their example, and certainly Fred Smith, who's going to be our speaker today, uh, I think that will embody us with this great view of a future that's indeed bright, despite all the budget problems. We'll get through all that stuff. But good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining us for this very special town hall. Now, I have two missions up here. First, I want to provide a welcome to our special guests, and there are many. And secondly, I want to introduce our speaker. 
So first, let me introduce and recognize some of the distinguished leaders we have in our audience today and a very special man who I uh, worked for at one time, General William G.T. Tuttle, was the former AMC Army Material Command Commander and also Vietnam Vet. Sir, thank you so much for being here. My best to you and Helen. Uh, Lieutenant General Retired Mick Kicklider over here. He was a former Deputy G4, served in the 101st in Vietnam, and he is currently the chairman of the National Vietnam War Commemoration and uh, a great teammate, and thanks, Mick, to you and all your team and the leadership you're providing in this very important recognition. Mr. Steve Calvary, who's the director of the Pentagon Force Protection Agency, uh, the director of the Army staff. I don't know if Bill Rizzoli was able to make it. He's probably in the chief's office working some tasker, but he may join us a little bit later. Also, Mr. Mike Rhodes, director of the admin and management at OSD. The next several folks are many of my uh, Army log buddies, or rather my logistics joint bu battle buddies from across all the services. Uh, we've traveled together through CENTCOM, AOR, several times over the last couple years, and they're truly magnificent teammates and good friends and, and really demonstrates the jointness of what our nation's military is all about. Uh, Vice Admiral Phil McCullum, uh, Cullum from the Navy, my good battle buddy from the Marines, Mark Faulkner, who's the, uh, the G4 for the Marine Corps. In fact, Mark, uh, Mr. Smith, and he may talk about this a little bit, so I won't try to steal too much of his thunder, but he was actually in the Army at one time. So he's done both services. So good, good to have you here, Mark. Uh, Rear Admiral Ronald Rabago from the Coast Guard. Uh, Major General Lee Levy from uh, the Joint Staff, representing uh, another good buddy of mine, another Marine, Bob Ruick, from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We also have a number of members of uh, the General Officer and Senior Executive Services from the G4 that are here, and so uh, thank you all. So to all our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are truly honored by your presence. Now, as the son of a three-tour Vietnam veteran, my dad actually started in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, I do really take great pride and honor in hosting this recognition of the over three million men and women of our military who answered their nation's call and served in Vietnam. Today is just one event of what is growing into a huge movement across the United States as we approach the 50th anniversary, hard to believe, of the Vietnam War. And in my mind, it is high time that we appropriately and broadly recognize our Vietnam warrior patriots and their families. The commemoration, as you saw in the video, began on a Memorial Day in 2002 and was initiated by President Obama at a ceremony at the Vietnam Memorial, which we refer to as the Wall. And this is going to last until 2025, covering that period of time that we had troops on the ground in Vietnam. Last fall, in this very auditorium, we held a ceremony, as I said before, to salute our nine Army G4 Vietnam veterans. Understandably, some of our veterans were somewhat reluctant to participate in that ceremony, perhaps concerned that the event might stir up some difficult memories. But as Senator McCain said in the video, and I quote, you don't want to relive it, but as a country and as individuals, we want to learn from it, end of quote. It was a special moment to see the current G4 officers and NCOs, many of them who had obviously have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, learn from our Vietnam veterans and hear about their experiences in war and what it was like when they came back home in those difficult times. And while the specifics of their stories might be different, what they each experienced and learned to cope with is strikingly similar. I wanted our teammates from across the entire joint logistics community to share this experience, so thanks again to all my joint brothers and sisters for being here today. Today we are here to learn from another Vietnam veteran founder and CEO of Federal Express, FedEx. When I spoke to Mr. Smith a few weeks ago and asked him how he would like to be introduced, in typical straightforward Marine Corps jargon, he said, as short as possible. I clearly understand your commander's intent, so I'll honor that request. Mr. Smith served two tours in Vietnam from 1967 to 1969 timeframe. First as a rifle platoon leader, later as a company commander. He received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and two Purple Hearts. The company he built and leads is 63rd on the Fortune 500 list. Those two bookends speak volumes about this American patriot. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Fred Smith, the CEO of FedEx. General, thank you. Good morning. 
Thank you very much for that kind introduction, General. I'm happy to be here today for several reasons. Number one, the DOD is a huge customer of FedEx, and you help, <laughs> and you help pay my salary. So I would be foolish if I did not acknowledge that right off on, uh, at the start of these remarks. Uh, we're proud to uh, support the, the DOD and the various branches of the service. We're the largest participant in the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, in fact, in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Uh, we flew about 25% of all the cargo uh, in that operation. So you might have a small war, but you can't have a big one without FedEx, and we appreciate the relationship. <laughs> in that regard, let me, let me, uh, let me just introduce two of my uh, compatriots, uh, Kristen Knott and Sharon Young. They're out there in the audience someplace who, who represent FedEx before the, the DOD, and we appreciate their, their work very much. Second reason I'm here is I've said over and over again in, in that little vignette that was played and every time I'm asked, everything that went into uh, making FedEx the uh, business it is today, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I think you'll see how it relates to the comments I have about my military service, was what I learned in the Marine Corps. And I've always been uh, grateful uh, for that education and the wonderful people I met and served with. And uh, so I'm always uh, happy to recount that to audiences uh, like this who are not surprised when I say that, but sometimes in business school they're quite amazed uh, when I uh, tell them that the genesis of FedEx was actually my days in the Marine Corps. And then third, I came up here because I'm such a an ardent fan of uh, the Defense Department. Uh, I'm just so proud of uh, you folks, and I, I am in awe of the quality of the troops and the uh, young officers who I have the opportunity to come in contact with. We have six uh, interns from the various services at FedEx. I met with, with our current batch of in, uh, interns uh, not too long ago, and uh, what, what a fantastic group of, of young people. It's uh, just a pleasure to, uh, to be here. And in that regard, um, I think the traditions and the uh, great leadership of our military goes back a long time, and I'll try to narrow down how I came to serve in the Marine Corps by telling you a story about uh, six of my relatives. Um, my Uncle Sam was uh, in the European theater during World War II uh, in the Army. My Uncle uh, Arthur was in the infantry on New, New Guinea. My Uncle Bill was a 17-year-old radio operator on a torpedo bomber in the Battle of the Coral Sea. He and my Uncle Arthur ran into each other coming around a corner in Honolulu. Neither one of them knew they were within 10,000 miles of one another. My father was a Navy commander uh, during the war. Uh, my father-in-law was a Marine in, in World War II and uh, Korea both. And uh, my father passed away when I was young. And my stepfather, who my mother married many years later, was a fighter pilot in China. So when uh, Senator Bob Dole <clears throat> asked me to be the co-chairman to raise the money for the World War II Memorial, which I thought would be a piece of cake. I went in the meeting firmly committed to tell him no, just because the time and the schedule uh, commitments. And of course, once I sat there and talked to Senator Dole, who had given so much to this country with a grievous wounding that he had suffered in uh, World War II in Italy, I came out as his bag man to raise the money for the <laughs> World War II Memorial. <laughs> And uh, one of the great days of my life was when we opened it up. So with that background of those six uh, relatives, it will not surprise you that, that uh, when I was coming out of uh, high school, there wasn't much question about the fact I was going to do my military service. It was just a matter of uh, which branch. And uh, uh, so uh, the Marine Corps appealed to me. The uniforms looked great. The platoon leader's class was... a uh, fantastic uh, 
program where you could go in the summer and didn't uh, bother any of your social life or athletics during the uh, academic year, and uh, I signed up. Sometime later, uh, when I got my commission, by the way, for those of you who are service academy uh, graduates, uh, most of my shipmates were Naval Academy guys. In fact, uh, one of my best friends ended up being a four-star, General Carl Fulford. You could tell General Fulford was going to be a general in basic school, and I was not. I can assure you that. <laughs> and it used to just drive them crazy that I had signed up for the PLCs in 1962, and they had been in the Naval Academy, and so I had data rank on them. I also made $100 more a month. <laughs> Of course, they wanted to disregard that uh, fantastic education that the, that the government uh, had, had gotten for them. In any case, you know the history of the Vietnam conflict as, as you're commemorating, and uh, by the time I was coming out of, of college, the potential for graduate school, which is what I'd uh, originally thought would be my track, uh, was uh, not possible. And, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time sent me a pleasant letter and told me that I would be at Quantico, Virginia on the 10th of June, shortly after my graduation when I was uh, commissioned. And we went through a very abbreviated uh, time at uh, basic school right down the road at Quantico. Normally a nine-month um, uh, syllabus had been uh, compressed to uh, six days a week. Uh, with night problems, and we were out of there in about five months. In those days, they were just uh, in the process of building I-95, and so per, one of the most dangerous things that happened to me in the Marine Corps was driving uh, from Quantico to Washington for Liberty on Saturday afternoons, uh, very fatigued with this accelerated thing, and you could always tell the guys who would stay a little bit too late because many of them had orange and white, uh, paint flicks on, uh, uh, on their car that they had bounced off the the uh, 55 gallon drums that were used by the construction guys. <laughs> For reasons still best known to the Department of the Navy, they assigned me to a very brief uh, interlude at the Defense Language School in uh, Monterey, California, which ended up being one of the most pleasant things that uh, I ever did. I didn't learn too much Vietnamese, but I learned the geography of Northern California and <laughs> all of the spots that uh, were good to go for a slow gin fizz pretty well. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, I joined uh, my unit in Chulai, which was initially to be the uh, third Marine Division, but it was the first uh, Marine Division I was changed over to at Okinawa because 1st Marine Division had been operating in uh, Operation Union 1, and I got there just at the end of, of uh, Union 2, which was a, which was a very uh, tough operation. I became a platoon leader and uh, served in uh, India Company and uh, Lima Company. Uh, then briefly was the 81 millimeter mortar uh, platoon leader, and I was supposed to be the S-4. Uh, but as I mentioned, I was a uh, PLC, and, uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, a USMCR. And I always thought after my service in Vietnam that what the R stood for was replaceable <laughs> because the general drill in those days was you would spend six or se seven months in the bush and then you'd get a, get a uh, staff billet. But we were so short of officers that uh, I was then given command of uh, K Company 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. And I have to tell you, even from the perspective of uh, operating a company that employs almost 350,000 people, uh, there is nothing in my life that I'm more proud of than commanding K Company 3-5. They were the finest group of young men in those days that uh, you could ever hoped to, to have, uh, courageous beyond belief, and uh, uh, the memory of that uh, billet uh, is with me every day of my life. But more importantly, I think the training that I received uh, from the Marine Corps in the PLC program and the basic school, particularly the emphasis on the Marine Corps, that the Marine Corps places on outstanding leadership at the first line uh, management level, 
the NCOs and the company grade officers was burned into my memory and to this day as I wrote in a little article uh, in the Naval Institute proceedings about my experience I still can't go to the front of the line at the cafeteria I still try to make sure my shoes are shined I still try to make sure that my haircut is reasonably uh, short. In fact, I got it cut because I was afraid to come up here in front of you, General, if I <laughs> been two days ago. And those principles are uh, the bedrock of, of FedEx. Now, I had a second tour in Vietnam uh, as a, a forward air controller with uh, Marine Observation Squadron 2 out of Marble Mountain. And I uh, witnessed during that period of three and a half years the tremendous change in the attitude uh, about the war in Vietnam. Quite frankly, when I was with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, I thought the war was going to be over in short order. I didn't think anybody could stand up to the type of uh, punishment that we were inflicting uh, on the, the North Vietnamese. And as most people know, the uh, battle for uh, Hue City and the uh, Tet Offensive was an enormous military defeat for the North Vietnamese, but a politically, uh, political victory in this country, which they subsequently acknowledged. Uh, I will say, as a matter of uh, historical record, I was very proud indeed uh, during the tail end of Operation Hue City to serve in the Army as I took my rifle company, Kilo 35, and was under the operational control of the 101st Airborne that was involved just north of uh, Way at the time. That's my brief Army uh, career of 10 days. <laughs> but the service in the wing and uh, the operation at, uh, with VMO2 was very integral also to my business career because the Marine Corps' air ground integration is a huge benefit. Uh, and our close air support in those days with uh, A4s and uh, to a lesser degree the, the F4s uh, was just spectacular. It was something that uh, was, was almost unbelievable, the precision and the coordination that we could, uh, we could bring to the, to the uh, battlefield. And one of the big innovations that uh, Federal Express did, nobody had ever done before, was to have integrated air ground <laughs> operations. The pickup and delivery folks were uh, just like the pilots and the airplanes and, and everything was coordinated just as we had done in the Marine Corps and all of those lessons that I'd learned there uh, on, the, on the ground and in the air in Vietnam uh, played over and over in my mind as we were putting together the business plan uh, for FedEx. You know the, um, the other thing that um, I think is important to recognize for those of you who make the military your career is the, the organizational disciplines that the military uh, developed over centuries really are at the heart of all organized activity uh, in the world. Uh, if you brought Julius Caesar back to earth he would understand the organization of, of FedEx because he basically invented it or the Roman army did. Uh, we have our proconsul in Hong Kong, he had his in Palestine. We have our proconsul in Brussels, he had his, his in Gaul. Uh, we have our technical folks, our IT people, our aviation maintenance folks, he had his charioteers, his catapult operators, his engineers. Uh, they operated in a matrix management system just like you did. Uh, they had a Navy that had to get their uh, troops around, so they had joint operations. One of the first things that the Romans did, which led to their power, was to focus on logistics, build an unprecedented communications network and a series of roads. So all major organizations are built on the same principles and organization structure that you deal with every, every day. They were modernized, of course, by the railroads, which were the next huge technological change that humankind dealt with uh, to put large complex organizations together. Now whether it's FedEx or IBM or Apple Computer or the US Marine Corps or the Coast Guard or what have you, we all use these same disciplines. And let me show you just two or three uh, slides here that uh, from a presentation I use that will, that will bring this point home. Bring up slide two if you wouldn't 
if you wouldn't mind here on the presentation. We have a very clear, like you do, mission statement. Everybody understands uh, what we're in business to do. Uh, you know, we don't uh, serve food. We don't uh, provide uh, services uh, for uh, beauty parlors or things of that nature. Uh, we're in the logistics business. Uh, slide three, I think you'll recognize as, as well, uh, just as Semper Fidelis is pretty well known as being associated uh, with the Marine Corps, we have the FedEx Purple Promise. Uh, all of our uh, operating companies have a distinct branding. Uh, Crimson is our freight company. Uh, Orange and Purple is our original express company, the worldwide uh, unit. Uh, purple and Green is our ground company. Purple and Blue is our uh, retail outfit. But the common color is purple. Uh, so we wanted a very simple statement that would be a guiding principle for every troop that we had to let inform them in whatever situation they might find themselves uh, as to how to conduct themselves. And there it is, the purple promise. I will make every FedEx experience outstanding. If you're guided by that, you can't go wrong. And I'd invite you to go up to a FedEx teammate and ask them what the purple promise is. I sure as hell hope they're going to give you that. <laughs> go to page four here. So uh, the, uh, we have a... a a strategy which you might find familiar, it's like your uh, joint forces strategy, you know, we'll, uh, we will uh, compete collectively, we'll operate independently, but we'll manage collaboratively. So uh, the next slide up, uh, page eight, will give you a, 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 an organization structure. Again, very similar to yours, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marine Corps, of course, the headquarters there. I guess we're the equivalent of the Coast Guard. The, but um, uh, we have uh, smaller operating companies that are subsidiaries of that. Read that to be the SEALs of Marine Recon or uh, the, the Delta Force uh, that are on very uh, uh, small niches. And page 10 will show you how we manage all this. Again, we have like a joint staff with our key operators, and the key staff people, we meet every Friday, we set the strategy, we try to, to manage the operation in a collaborative uh, uh, manner with each operating company focused on its particular set of core competencies. And because of that, we have um, grown to almost $50 billion in revenue. We operate uh, 650 airplanes, it's the largest all cargo commercial fleet in the world. It's the largest wide-body fleet of any type, passenger or cargo. Uh, we employ about uh, 350,000 people in the total uh, uh, FedEx system around the world. We operate in 220 some odd countries and uh, territories. In fact, we operate one way or another in every place that you could want to send something or receive something from with the exception of those places like Iran and North Korea that are prohibited by the uh, U.S. government. And finally, to square the circle, so to speak, our corporate philosophy is summed up in the same words almost exactly uh, uh, that I could have written uh, after my uh, time in basic school, uh, except the word profit would have been substituted for something else. People service profit. You take care of the folks. Uh, treat them right, put good leaders in front of them, uh, communicate with them, uh, set the example, make sure that uh, they understand what's in this for them, the importance of what they're doing. You take care of those folks and they'll provide that service, keeping that purple promise, and the profit will, uh, will uh, uh, take care of itself. So yesterday, uh, FedEx was named on the fortunes list of uh, uh, most admired. Uh, again, number eight, and I can assure you that the reason that happened has very little to do with me and everything to do with those 350,000 folks. Let me just conclude by saying I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak to you today. The uh, voices of those three million veterans from Vietnam uh, haven't been heard over the years to the extent that 
Many of us who served there uh, think that they should have. Uh, Senator Jim Webb used to comment on this all the time. You know, the, the prototypical uh, Vietnam veteran in the media and all was some crazed, deranged person when the vast majority of people who served in Vietnam were enormously proud of their service, uh, learned a great deal from the service as I did, and uh, are uh, et uh, eternally uh, grateful for what the military taught us. And let me conclude by saying before we do the Q&A, uh, one uh, final remark. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my comrades uh, from uh, the Vietnam conflict uh, whose names are on the wall. On the top of the Arlington Cemetery where your dad is buried, there are two graves. <clears throat> one of them is General of the Army, uh, uh, John uh, uh, Pershing, and the other one is First Lieutenant Richard Pershing of the 101st Airborne. Dick Pershing and I were best of friends in, in college, and Dick was killed in February 68 in the Tet Offensive. I think about Captain Hank Kulikowski and uh, Jack Ruggles and um, Joe Campbell and uh, all of the wonderful men I served with. And finally, I'd commend to you a shipmate of mine I'd, this afternoon when you got a spare minute. I know most of you don't have any spare time, but sneak on Google and pull up Father Vincent Capadano. Father Vince was our battalion chaplain, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. He's the only uh, chaplain to ever receive the Medal of Honor for serving with the Marine Corps. They named the ship after uh, Father Vince. They should have named uh, two carriers after him. He was a great hero and uh, my daughter is a movie producer and she was shooting a movie in New York and I slipped out to see her one day and drove down to Staten Island and there's Father Vince's grave. No mention of the Medal of Honor which would be typical of him but on his headstone were little coins from every branch of the service. Navy, Air Force, Army, Marines, Coast Guard. So it did my heart good to know that people still remember Father Vince. And uh, if I can make one of you just uh, think on those folks a few minutes today, my trip up here will be worth it. Thank you very much. Q&A? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. We're supposed to do Q&A. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, sir, thank you very much for your comments and sharing your experiences. We'll now move to the question and answers. There will be uh, three ushers, one on the left, the right, and the center. So we'll start now with, uh, with the questions. Please, sir, go ahead. Development so forth. How important is FedEx to a smart power for the United States? Well, you know, I think uh, the most important thing that's happened to the world in the last uh, 30 or 40 years is the United States leadership in opening markets around the world. Now, I'm very proud of the fact that the, the man who really initiated this line of thinking was a good Tennessean, Cordell Hull, who was the Secretary of State during World War II, and he used to be fond of quoting a, a, an older philosopher that, you know, when, when goods cross borders, armies rarely do. So the United States has uh, been the champion of open markets and free trade, and because of that, along with the Marshall Plan, we rebuilt Germany, we rebuilt Japan, allowing them to sell into our markets, sometimes with them not being as open on their side of the house. The Chinese, of course, have pulled 600, 650 million people out of abject poverty by trading with mostly the United States and, and Europe. So, it's important, I think, that the United States remember 
what we are admired for and for what we're not. And uh, our uh, system of uh, free markets, open trade, and uh, engagements with countries, uh, which I think uh, in the scheme of things it would be called smart power, is very, very important. And I think FedEx plays a very integral role in that. In fact, our board of directors met in, uh, in China, and Zhang Zemin, who was the president of China at the time, I started to give him the background on FedEx, and he gave me a lecture on FedEx. He said, you folks, and we've been operating in China for 30 years, have allowed us to get our goods to the marketplace and, and employ our people. So I, I think uh, in the years to come, particularly with the lethality of the weapons that are out there today and the inconceivable prospect of a major power, major power uh, conflict with uh, the, the damage that could be done today, I think we have to go down this road of smart power. Okay, next question, back there, right in the center. Please wait till you get the microphone and then announce your organization and your name, please. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Colonel Shulia J. McClaney, and I'm the Chief for Operational Energy in the G4. I'm going to start in your portfolio. You have an energy initiative called uh, EA Watcher, and you've been able to save 93% reduction across energy and FedEx. Sir, how do you maintain your momentum with regards to energy? Well, we have our equivalent of you, Colonel, and uh, <laughs> uh, Mitch, Mitch Jackson uh, is an indefatigable zealot that reminds everybody in the company every day that uh, not only is it the right thing to do in terms of sustainability, but it's bottom line uh, important for us. So we have numerous initiatives from putting uh, bloom uh, electricity generators in our hub at Oakland. We have solar panels on our Newark Express hub, our Woodbridge FedEx ground hub, our uh, Frankfurt location. In our new facility at Chicago Hare Airport, we have the biggest single, uh, I guess you'd call it a farm on top of a building. There, there are plants up there. And uh, <laughs> <coughs> so uh, we are uh, decreasing our use of, of electric power almost every place. We have reduced our uh, petroleum consumption, diesel and gasoline in our express unit, uh, for example, by 30% over the last uh, seven or eight years. We're making enormous capital investments in our new 777 long range uh, freighters, which can fly 100 tons nonstop from Hong Kong to Indianapolis or, or Memphis. Just unbelievable. New 767s, which, by the way, are being built on the same line as the new uh, KC 46 Pegasus, I think the new name for it is. In fact, FedEx's order is what allowed Boeing to keep that line open and make the tankers for the Air Force. The 777 consumes 18% less fuel uh, than the MD-11s it replaces, goes 2,000 miles further nonstop with 100 tons on board. The 767s are 30% more fuel efficient. We have about 500 hybrid electrics and all electrics. So we have an incredible initiative, and you've got an important job here, and I uh, applaud you for it, because everything you can save goes right to the bottom line of DOD, and maybe you can keep one of those brigades that are at risk of being eliminated. Cool. Yeah. There's, a, now there's somebody over here. Don't forget, I, I'm a conservative now. I don't want to get all left wing. <laughs> Sir, I'm Bill King. I work for General Mason. Um, on behalf of the uh, Vietnam veterans on my row here, we want to thank you for sharing your time and your story with us this morning. It means a lot to us. My question is, in industry now, we see these remote autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, Amazon is experimenting with drones as a possible delivery message or delivery vehicle. Is that part of FedEx's future also? Well, I think uh, there has been a lot of hype on drones. 
Uh, drones for uh, local commercial delivery have many, many problems like privacy issues, safety issues, regulatory issues, et cetera. They've got one very big problem, however, and it's called gravity. And <laughs> all, all, all of us know that it takes a lot of energy to take something and put it into the air, whether it's an F-35 or a small drone. In fact, I was interviewed on this and said we had been experimenting drones and our chief information officer had one and on his farm and we had concluded it could carry four Budweiser's. That was about <laughs> the, that went all over the world. <laughs> now, having said that, in all seriousness, I think that robotics and autonomous systems are going to be prolific. But I think uh, that the aviators in the audience will be very familiar with the progress of, of such technology uh, in airplanes. I mean, the autopilots and the auto land features uh, of airplanes today allow them, should we desire to do it, to be fully autonomous. Our pilots can uh, get pushed back in one of our triple sevens, and if they wanted to, they can punch a button and never touch the controls until the airplane taxis up to the gate 6,000 nautical miles away. But we like our pilots in the airplanes because they've got something that a computer never can have, and that's the judgment that their years of training brings to them. So I think what you'll see in vehicles, and I think what you see in the military drones, the Predators and the, uh, and the uh, Raptors and that sort of thing is the same type of thing. The equipment is very sophisticated, there's automation, but there's an officer or an NCO there that's in the loop. So I don't think that you're going to see fully autonomous trucks, fully autonomous uh, airplanes in the commercial sector for many, many years, but I think you will see the technology make it safer and safer, more precision. Uh, like our trucks today, we're putting these new things on that prohibit you from, they'll stop you before you can crash into somebody in the back. You can't change lanes without it intervening. So I think that that evolutionary track is the one we're on. Uh, we're working with the Air Force at the moment uh, who's very interested in using autonomous flights or uh, data links so that C-17s when they mount out don't have to have supernumerary crews. I mean, there are a lot of places those C-17s can go, which is an incredible machine, you know, land in a short field. It's not a pleasant place to be overnight. So you don't want a crew that's been completely fatigued with a 10,000-mile uh, trip uh, that then has to come in and, and take evasive action. So both FedEx and the Air Force and, uh, are working with Boeing to try to, to make the supernumerary located someplace else. So I think that's the track it's going to take, some sort of hybrid thing where you still have folks in the loop, but the technology expands their capability. So I'm over here. Next question, right here in front. Naval Wilson. Good morning, sir. Curtis Duncan, Joint Guam Program Office. Uh, sir, you mentioned taking care of your people. Uh, could you please share with us how FedEx uh, takes care of their people, and particularly those items that are non-tangible? Well, you know, uh, the, the study of sociology has shown that every human being, particularly in an industrial setting, much less than a military setting, has a hierarchical set of needs. Uh, they want to know when they join an outfit, uh, what do you expect me to do? You've got to train them. They uh, want to know, is what I'm doing important? You've got to tell them what they're doing is important and why it's important. You've got to uh, tell them uh, what's in it for them. In our particular case, everybody in the company has incentive compensation related to how well the company does. The vast majority of our senior officers that were in that strategic management uh, committee uh, chart that I showed you started off as pickup and delivery people or washing airplanes. Uh, so we promote from within. Uh, you have to have a system that uh, everybody knows that, uh, where they can go to get justice. I'll give you a specific example of my military experience that I put into FedEx. Uh, we have uh, 
in FedEx Express a system called the GFT, the Guaranteed Fair Treatment Policy. If you get disciplined or you have something that happens to you that you don't think is right, you can request mass, so to speak. You can take it up. If you get fired, you can ask this to be reviewed all the way up to the CEO, the president of that operating unit, and a review board checks to see that this person has been fairly treated and done in accordance with policy. On some occasions, that review board will give the disciplinary proceeding to a peer review board made up of the person's own peers. And uh, in those peer groups, they can overturn management's decisions, just like a, a, a court martial or a mass can in the, in the military. Uh, now, we don't have some of the other features the military has. When Back in my day, it was before they reformed the UCMJ, so we did things all the way up to capital cases as defense or, or prosecutors. You get some kid in there, and uh, you, are, you could get an enlisted man on your court martial. And I'd tell them, you know, don't do that. And, uh, oh, he'll know what I'm doing. I said, no, he won't. He'll want to burn you because, you know, he don't... He don't want to put up with a damn jerk like you. <laughs> so that whole process of requesting mass and going up to everything, that came directly from the Marine Corps. And so that's the main thing, is to select people that are fit for the job, that are motivated to do it, and answer those uh, Maslavian questions. But probably more important than that, and what the military knows better than anybody, is you have to have first class, first level, and second level management. That's where the whole game is won and lost in the service business. Because what you're trying to do is similar to what you're trying to do in the military, and that's withdraw discretionary effort. And why leadership is so important in the military is you're trying to withdraw the discretionary effort of somebody up to and including losing their life to achieve the organization's mission or goals. In sports, same thing. We've all seen lesser uh, teams beat the favorite and, and uh, so forth by withdrawing that discretionary effort. Most businesses never thought about that. Maybe you don't have to if you're making Model T Ford, you know, just plugging the thing in it. But once you get in the service business, the discretionary effort to us is the difference between somebody doing the minimum job that they need to do every day to keep from getting fired and the very best job that they could do. Now that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars for us. And the most, most important element in that is answering those questions that I just mentioned, you know, and, and, and keeping your word, but most importantly, putting great first level managers there. So it's not by accident that FedEx, our management school, is called our Leadership Institute. And we have a rigorous selection process. And some people just don't have the capabilities to be effective leaders. Doesn't mean they're bad people. They may be a fantastic, you know, tech person. Or, and we have a career path for that. So we spend a lot of time putting outstanding people in those first and second levels of management position. So that's how we try to keep that PSP philosophy alive. Okay, we have time for one more last question. Sir, right here. Jim. Sir, I'm Colin Agee from Army G2, and this is a follow-up on your discussion of your people. You know, most of us got our impression of FedEx employees from seeing Tom Hanks on the big screen, and it would be an understatement to say that he was a bit compulsive about staying on schedule. In your business, for you personally or FedEx corporately, is this an issue, and how do you address that corporately? Well, to answer your question, indulge me, let me tell you how that movie came about, because it has to do with the Marine Corps. And um, <laughs> I mentioned to you that I had the honor of serving with Senator Dole as his co-chairman on the World War II Memorial. And when we were trying to raise this $160 million, which took us seven years, one of the hardest things I ever did. In fact, there are people, when they see me walking down the street, go to the other side of the road, because they know, <laughs> you know I'm out there trying to get something from them. So Senator Dole and I and the other people that are involved, there are a lot of other people, like General Hurling and uh, uh, 
uh, General P.X. Kelly, who was the head of the Battlefield Monuments Commission, we were all sitting around one day and we said, we need a spokesman. There had been a lot of people that helped us, like uh, Tom Brokaw and all, but we need a face for this. So we decided that the ideal face was Tom Hanks because he had played Captain Miller. And uh, we put together this incredible spiel and called Tom Hanks on the phone, and we got about 20 seconds into this five-minute plaintiff uh, speech, and he said, wait a minute, guys, I'm your man. And he said, I went over there, didn't really know about World War II, went up on all those uh, cemeteries, and he said, I will do anything you ask me to do. So he worked to get the World War II memorial built. So I, some years later, I get a call <clears throat> from my friend Bill Broyles. Bill had been a Marine in Vietnam, and I didn't know him there, but we knew each other through veterans channels and so forth, and he was a screenwriter. Did uh, Apollo 13, and he was very close to Tom Hanks. He said, Smith, I've got this incredible idea, and there's only one actor in the world that can pull it off, and it's Tom Hanks, and he gains 60 pounds, he loses 60 pounds, he doesn't speak for half the movie, he's all of these sort of things going on, and he's got to be this time-obsessed jerk who becomes this modern, modern uh, Robin Crusoe, and you got to let me be, let him be a FedEx guy. And if you let me make Tom Hanks a FedEx guy, this will be a hundred million dollar infomercial for the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, I know Broyles well enough to know that there's got to be a catch here, right? <laughs> Said, well, we've got to crash one of your planes. <laughs> so I went into head of our marketing and said, you're not going to believe what I just agreed to. But <laughs> the, the, the two guys that, that are involved in this thing, I trust with my life. One of them is Bill Broyles, who was Marine Lieutenant in Vietnam, and the other one is Tom Hanks, who's one of the best guys I ever met. That's how Castaway came about. Now, to say that he made uh, Tom Hanks a paranoid... Uh, obsessed person. I don't think we have many folks like that, but inside FedEx, if you came to one of our operations, you would find it very familiar. Because people do take time, mission, accomplishments, accountability, results appropriately. So that's how Tom Hanks became the guy that went to Russia and was appalled by all of their uh, annex there trying to get it squared away and became the uh, modern Robinson Crusoe. Last thing I'll tell you about that, people don't know this, but we actually made a commercial that showed what was in the package. And I called Tom Hanks and I said, can we make this commercial? He, they, he and his agent, they gave us and we showed it one time on the Super Bowl. Did any of you ever see it? This guy looks exactly like Tom Hanks with that beard. He walks up to a house. He rings the doorbell. The lady answers the door. He says, I've been on this desert island for however long it was, three years. The only thing that kept me going was my mission to deliver this package to you. <laughs> and she says, that's very admirable. So he loads off his shoulders. He gives her the package. He starts walking down the, the uh, sidewalk. And he turns back, and some of them says an afterthought, and says, I just got to ask you what was in that package. And of course, she's opened it by now. She said, nothing much. You know, there's a satellite phone, some fishing gear, <laughs> a mirror, and so forth. Thank you very much. OK. Great. How are you? Doing? How are you? If you join me up here. I see you. Let me get this. Well, I don't know about the rest of the crowd here, but that's about the best hour I've had in the Pentagon in about three years. So thank you, sir. I know you're a busy man. You, you, I'm glad you to take be here. some time and, and an talk honor. about it. it. It's been an honor for us as well. And I will tell you that uh, a bunch of us just got back from the Middle East, traveled out extensively, and FedEx is everywhere on the battlefield. We couldn't go to war without you. Thanks for your great support of the American military and their families. God bless you, sir. We'd like to give you a little token of appreciation. Great. Understand you're a bit of a historian. This is a book about Washington, D.C., where it was oh, and where you. it is now today. Thank so uh, thanks I'm again, thrilled. and uh, God bless you thank very you much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Hey, General. How you doing? Tell yeah, yeah, General Amos I said hello. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, he's a good man. Yeah, good to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Battlefield to Boardroom Town Hall. Thank you all for your attendance and, most importantly, your support for our Vietnam veterans. I encourage everyone to visit the booth outside for more information on the Vietnam War's 50th commemoration. And please remain seated as the official party and special guests depart for the Senior Leaders Luncheon. Again, thank you all very much. It's, a, it's, a, it's what I really just the video that they played.